Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the How to Film Weddings podcast. As you can see, we have another episode. We were not in our normal spot. John and I are actually together. I know you might not be able to tell on the screen, but but here I am. There we are. Yeah, we're, we're here together. Um, we This last week, we have been at a little music bed retreat kind of thing with some other really awesome wedding filmmakers. And so we thought we would uh, record another podcast here together. So yeah, it's been a fun week. It's the yeah. last day of us being here and we have been staying at Music Bed's awesome lake house and they invited us out and treated us well, fed us so many different foods. I got sick almost one night. It was dry heaving. I ate too much food. We've been in the pool. We've been in the hot tub. We fly in the drone. We've been playing basketball. It's been really cool. All we sorts of stuff. Yeah. Had a lot of friends here. Matt Johnson, KEJ, Blink Films, Brothers Martins, Russell Kent Nichols, Bottle Brush Films. Did I leave anybody out? Us. And we've, us. Been, we've been here too. And so we got to do a really cool live session at Music Bed headquarters, FM headquarters, with re- the recording artist Victoria Bigelow. She's on Music Bed, so be sure to check them out. But yeah, we're here. We're at a lake house. We're sitting in front of a window. So if the light changes in and out, in and out, don't uh, leave us a message in the comments. We yeah, know. we know. We know what's up. We know. Uh, but Nick, uh, I a lot of good things have been happening. Number yes. one, I wanted to throw it out there too because I know a lot of people are getting back into editing for the year or getting into their weddings. Mm-hmm. Our mm-hmm. friends over at Weditor, howtofilmweddings.com slash Weditor, um, highly recommend them. And I just got back my film from Cabo. If you want to check that out on my YouTube channel, you can. But just got a teaser back. Just got the full film back. Also got my Baton Rouge film back. And my message that I sent to Sarah was like, this is really starting to fire on all cylinders. The uh, collaboration between them and myself, it's a great option. So if you're needing um, outsourcing uh, for your year, be sure to check out howtofilmweddings.com slash Weditor. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah, Weditor has been doing a great job uh, for both of us for a while now, so definitely go check them out if you um, are in the uh, the neighborhood for an editor. So um, as we announced on our podcast last week, uh, the Complete Wedding Videography course is opening up for enrollment one week from today, yeah. as we drop this one week from today. And we actually have an entire new module that we have uploaded into that. And we're, uh, some of the feedback we got from the initial uh, creation of the Complete Wedding Videography course was uh, the information on the shooting section is really good, but we're not seeing you do it. And so we actually took a couple of days last fall and filmed an entire wedding from start to finish. Everything that we were thinking of, um, you know, from establishing shots to miking the bride and the groom to toasts to audio, everything that we could think of. It was next level stuff, in in our opinion, um, that we were doing that can really help people out to get it. And so that will be new to anyone that purchases moving forward. Or if you purchased it in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. You're just going to get that. So uh, that that's awesome. And if you head over to completeweddingvideography.com, you can download a free section. Um, it's all about consultations and stuff. But we also have a couple of freebies in there. And one of those is one section from our new shooting module, just so you can get a taste of it and uh, understand, uh, get a feel for mm-hmm. kind of how everything's going to go. And kind of along those lines of us celebrating that we have this new shooting module as a part of our uh, our, our course. Today, we wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about um, how we shoot a wedding ceremony in 2023. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything that has changed for us? Is there anything that we're thinking about? So we're going to take a few minutes and do as best as we can to describe shooting a wedding. We know this is an audio podcast, so sometimes that's weird, but uh, mm-hmm. we think that this is going to be valuable and helpful information to a lot of people out there, especially who have maybe not shot a ton of wedding ceremonies before. So um, that's what we're going to talk about today, yeah. shooting ceremonies. Yeah, I want to add to, you said it, but I want to make sure people know on the complete video course, uh, we did film a wedding. And the wedding itself, though, was a wedding that we put on. Yes. So it yes. wasn't like a like you've seen maybe in the past, like a behind the scenes at a wedding. Mm-hmm. We literally hired a venue or rented a venue for two days, hired mm-hmm. a planner, florist, everything, DJ, so we could like plug into their board, so we could you know take our time lighting toasts and walk through that, walk through how to do a ceremony. And so in that new module is literally myself and Nick walking through visually 
how to film a wedding ceremony. And there's a special guest as the officiant. Blake, the editor, uh-huh. it was the officiant for our couple. So we hired a couple that had just gotten married for uh, you know models for us and were able to walk through how to get interviews with them, how to mic them, how to... All of the stuff, everything, how mm-hmm. to get footage of the dress, how to get the groom, yep. it's everything. And so um, that alone, we when we recorded it, we were thinking this was going to be a, a separate course. And that's how we recorded it with as much value as it would be to pay for just this module. And as we got to really like diving into it and thinking about the brand of how to film weddings, instead of just creating a new product, we wanted to really update the current product. And so the complete wedding videography course coming out May 8th. Um, a lot of big things in there all the way from everything to do to run your business from, you know, how to set it up, how to run it, all the, everything, how to do consultations through the shooting and then also through the editing. And so it's literally called the complete wedding videography course because it's the complete wedding videography course. And so, yeah, we were talking today and, uh, last week we had our episode, um, really went well. And then this week we wanted to go even, you know, further with a practical how to kind of episode. And so, um, we've talked before on the podcast about how to film a ceremony or how we film a ceremony. So we just kind of wanted to walk through where we're at this year, um, and how we're planning on doing it with updates to technology, with updates to our cameras. Um, things have changed. I used to shoot with four cameras and my biggest change is that now I'm only shooting with three cameras. And so by moving to Sony, I guess a year now, a year and a half ago now, um, I've been able to really change the way I do this. And so only three cameras, everything's fitting in one backpack. And so we'll get into that. Um, Nick, I'll let you, I'll throw it back over to you. When you're thinking for your ceremonies coming up this year, um, what is your plan? Like describe us your thought process for how you, like what's important for you to capture and then maybe how you're planning to do that. So I would say, you know, for us new in 2023, um, the biggest thing that as Jen and I have talked about the weddings that we're going to film is I'm going to start leaving my gimbal at home. Um, I've been bringing it and I've been, uh, you know, just getting a a few shots, but it's the same shots at every wedding, you know, uh, gimbal push in, pull out of the ceremony of the reception space, the bride walking down. Of the, and she was like, you know what, let's we're getting very repetitive in how the ceremony stuff works out. And so we're going to try not having our gimbal um, for that. So I'm going to have to figure, uh, I still don't have my first wedding of the year for a couple of months. So I'm going to have to figure out how I'm going to use, because I normally film the bride walking down from behind and then set my gimbal in the middle of the aisle as my gimbal shot or my aisle shot. So I'm going to need to do a little bit of of brainstorming and figuring out, do I want to have another tripod and have it there? Do I want to, um, you know, just put little feet maybe on the bottom of the camera and still use it the same way, but just handhold it walking down, you know, those kind of things. Uh, but that, that's going to be a, a big change for how we are doing stuff. It's just specifically with all the travel that we do, it's just another thing that I have to find room for and pack. And, um, you know, I thought, Hey, you know what? I think, I think maybe we'll leave this at home and just kind of see. So that's, that's probably the biggest change that is going to happen. Um, for 2023, for us. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I can't imagine not having the gimbal maybe one day, but I don't need it really as much now that we've got the Sony's, but, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. yeah, Like for me, I'm, as I'm thinking about ceremonies and everything and what's important to me more so than the most epic angles and and that sort of thing. Although I think that's great. I really want to focus a lot more on the action and the reaction. I think a lot of us focus on the action really well. Um, but reaction shots. And that's where to me, like I did one wedding last year in Lake Placid where we had three cameras, but then I also just had a fourth camera on a monopod. Um, And so I've gone back and forth of like having the three cameras set and then a roaming camera because I was able to get so many different reaction shots. You know, seeing the mother and father of the bride or the groom like as the vows are happening or watching people clap after the kiss or, um, so reactions are really important to me. And so I'm just thinking like, um, I'm not trying to do anything super fancy with my ceremonies, but, um, I am going to keep the gimbal. I, I love the look of it with the kind of films that I'm wanting to do. Um, but I, I think for me, it's 
a three camera setup, a bride camera, a groom camera, a back angle camera or camera one camera, spouse one, spouse two, and then, um, an angle from the back with, with my gimbal. So, um, both of the side cameras are going to be on long lenses, 70 to 200s kind of crossing. Um, and then the back camera, uh, the gimbal would, is going to be on my 24 to 70. Um, I do love to follow the, the bride in behind, um, give 10, 15 feet of space, follow her in, sit the camera down. And then after the ceremony gets up and going a little bit, that's when I pick my gimbal back up and do a couple of like really wide swoops of what's going on. And then I leave the gimbal in the aisle, the whole ceremony until I know the kiss is about to happen. I pick the camera up, stand next to the photographer in the aisle. And I walk backwards elbow to elbow with the photographer as they've kissed and get that nice exit shot for me. Um, processional. I can talk about that in a little bit, but what, what do you want to add? As, as uh, you know, we talked to more couples and stuff. Um, the thing that they really want from the ceremony, um, I think, is the reactions of seeing each other, especially if they don't um, do a first look beforehand. So those are really, really important. So we're doing everything we can to get a good shot of the groom, Whoever's at the front, whenever their spouse walks down the aisle, we're trying to get both of those shots really, really well. The other thing that we always want to uh, include and capture is going to be the audio stuff. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're, we're micing the bride, we're micing the groom, we're micing the officiant, we're plugging into any system that they have uh, so that they can hear, hear that stuff. Uh, so those are, those are the, the two big main important things that, that we're wanting to do. And then anything else on top of that to me is you know, the icing on the cake or whatever. So um, on the audio side of things, mm -hmm. I still have never mic'd a bride for a ceremony. Mm -hmm. um, I just choose not to do it. I don't want to do it, first of all. <laughs> Secondly, um, I, I feel like it's a little ob obtrusive for what I'm, I want for our couples. Take it or leave it. Do however you want. Uh, I don't think it's a bad thing. The audio sounds way better, so I get it. Um, the way I've been getting around that a little bit is whoever's walking the bride down the aisle, I'm usually throwing a mic on them. So if it's the bride and her dad, I'm micing the dad just in case they say anything going down the aisle. Um, and then, yeah, you have to do more work in post to like get it to sound good. It sounds so much better with the mic on the bride. And so that is very important. I balance it back and forth. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm playing with the idea, you know, it's like, oh, if I mic dad, who else can I mic? You know, I'm thinking about people like Justin Porter, who is like micing everybody. It's like, should I mic the groomsman? Should I mic the best man? Should I? And so like, depending on this whole like action and reaction and telling stories, I think that, I guess why I'm saying all this is that's like, there's no like right way to do it. It just, are you being intentional with the way you do it? That's is it informed? Yeah. Cause to me intentional, like I know that the bride would enjoy the way she sounds better. But to me, I intentionally don't want to like bother her with it. I'd, I'm sure they would be fine. It's comfortable. It's whatever. You forget it's there. But that's my intention behind it. And then I also just don't want to, like, I don't have my wife there to help me or anything. But I'm doing other things intentionally to make sure that if they do talk when they're coming down the aisle or, um, you know. So anyway, I just want to throw that out there. Be intentional. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's definitely not something that you need to do. Um, but we've just found, you know, um, on really windy days when the ceremony's outside or stuff like it has definitely saved, um, saved our bacon. And I know that I, people, the pushback is, Oh, the groom mic is good enough. The groom mic is good enough, which it is until it's not. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, okay, what do I do? And I know now with the invention of AI technology and like that sort of stuff, like there's lots of things that can, you know, help you in those situations. Mm -hmm. But uh, we are always micing the bride if it is possible. Now, again, if they're, um, you know, doing traditional vows or it's just repeat after me kind of stock stuff, um, maybe that's not as important mm -hmm. to mic either of them really. But again, we're, we're just standard. We're doing it all the time um, whenever, whenever we can. So I wanted to just talk you through real quick kind of our process of how we're filling the ceremony ceremony. Um, just in case, you know, there's people out there uh, that, that don't have a game plan yet. And again, we are going two shooters. And I think maybe I, I I'll talk through what I do. And I know what John does is very similar. And then maybe what our plan would be if, if we were solo shooting. Um, we're going to say this up front. If you are planning on delivering a ceremony edit, you need to be filming with at least two cameras. At least two. 
uh, just so you have something to cut between. Um, and so that, so we are filming our ceremonies with three cameras and how it works is I will put my a cam, um, as the groom reaction. And I am putting that typically on the side close to the front, um, which will be the side whenever the ceremony starts that whoever's at the front is looking at typically say a groom, but you know, it could be bright, you know, whatever, whoever is looking, uh, that direction, whenever they like look at each other, mm -hmm. that's, that's, I'm going to put the camera looking towards their face. And then Jen will be shooting up the aisle. So she's getting all the bridal party as they come down. And then, um, you know, uh, whenever the spouse walks down the aisle, you know, she's getting that shot. And then I was following behind with my third, third angle with my gimbal. Uh, like I said earlier, um, again, not sure exactly what I'm going to do with that, but as soon as, um, you know, let's say it's the bride walking down the aisle after she gets a few s steps in, I'm ducking out. Like that is, that is a thing that I am really conscious of that I'm trying to do is get that walk behind shot, but also not get in Jen's way or the photos way when they're shooting up the aisle. So doing my best to get out of the way so they can get at least some of that without me in it. And then, um, Jen is taking from shooting up the aisle. She's going to where my camera was that was sh shooting the angle of the person up front. And then I am taking my camera and walking all the way back around to the other side. So now the two cameras are pointing at the front. Their beams would be crossing each other on a long lens. We use 7200s. And then my aisle cam would be on the ground um, in the middle, just shooting forward, capturing everything. That's mm -hmm. You do anything different there? It's very, it's very similar. Uh, I think my feedback would be uh, the 180 rule, and I just yeah. want to talk about that for one second. Um, a lot of times, um, people film a ceremony where if it's a bride and groom, you get a shot of the groom and he's looking to his left, and then it cuts to the bride and they're also looking to their left. It's like they're both looking the same direction, and the reason that that is the case because the cameras have broken the 180 rule it can be difficult during a ceremony um, you mentioned like the beams coming off your camera if you imagine like laser beams uh, coming off of the lenses if the lenses like whatever they're shooting towards there's a laser beam if those laser beams cross you're going to be doing like if they cross each other you're going to be doing just fine and the way that you can without having to get too scientific on a ceremony if you're thinking about an aisle right down the middle of the aisle if you drew a line dead center that would split between spouse one and spouse two if they were up front and if every camera stays on one side of that line for the processional that's going to help you to have uh it's going to just make more sense i think about uh it's the playoffs for the nba right now if i was watching a basketball game and lebron james steals the ball and he starts dribbling this way down the court and then it cuts to another camera angle and he's dribbling this way it wouldn't make sense. You know, if he's dribbling to his, it's going to the left of the screen and then all of a sudden it cuts, he's dribbling the opposite way towards the right. You'd be like, what the heck? Why did he turn around? It doesn't make sense. But if you think about how they film a sports game or a, a live event, whatever, there's a line drawn down the center of the court, um, not, not half court line, but the center of the court and everybody stays on one side of that so that it makes sense. And so um, why does that matter? It's not like that's the rule and you can break that rule but it just makes more sense. And with the viewer in mind, when you see that groom looking you know, to the right and he's like trying to hold it all in and then you see the bride and she's looking to her left, subconsciously you say, oh, they're looking at each other. And if they're both looking the same direction, maybe it makes the viewer think, what's happening over there to the right of the screen? What are they both looking at? Why are they about to cry? And so the processional if you're keeping everybody on that same side of the line. So Nick was talking about like in a bride and groom scenario, you've got camera one, the a cam on the groom, his profile or a little bit over a different 15, 30 degree angle to see his face. If you were on the opposite side of that line, shooting up the aisle, the face, like it can get all wonky and look bad. So like we keep all of our, like Jen would be at the front of the aisle in front of the groom, but not blocking the groom so that she could shoot up the aisle. Another, another thing with that is, um, if you're on a gimbal or you have a tripod that's at the back, kind of getting everything wide, make sure that like the, whoever is shooting up the aisle and that tripod are on the same side. Yeah. 
I mean, it, it's it's gonna do, it's it's the same thing. Just draw that line down the middle and keep everything on the same side. Now, after the ceremony starts, now we're drawing a line at the front of the ceremony and putting everything on one side of that line. Mm-hmm. And just that's that's the idea is uh, following that one eighty rule, drawing a line and keeping all the cameras on one side of that, so it doesn't look weird and it doesn't look strange. Yeah. So, so we have, um, after the ceremony gets going, we have our one in the middle and then we have our two on the sides and like John, our two angle side angle cams are going to be on 70 to 200. It's pretty much all the way into 200 usually. And then I have my 24 to 70, typically pretty wide, usually at about 35, I would mm-hmm. say is what I like to keep it at in the middle. And then, um, leave it there the whole time. Like I'm not picking up the aisle cam. I'm not getting reaction shots. Um, that's just not something that that we're doing very often. If they make a point of it in the middle of the ceremony to say something like I think of one we did last, last year where uh, everyone did a toast in the middle of the ceremony. So we quickly moved our cameras to get some reactions of people, you know, holding up their champagne glasses and that kind of thing. But typically we're just leaving it on the couple and then they do the kiss. Um, and I'm leaving my camera that was in a bride and groom situation was on the bride angle. Jen stays on them, and then I would go grab my gimbal camera or my aisle camera and pick it up and walk back mm-hmm. with the couple, and that's that's how we would film the yeah. ceremony. Attention wedding filmmakers. The best resource for licensing music for your wedding films is Musicbed. I have been exclusively using Musicbed for about eight years, and our films are better because of it. I hear a lot from our couples that reach out to us that our wedding films feel different, that the music isn't cheesy. Musicbed has a roster of incredibly talented musicians, bands, and composers who pour their hearts into their work, and you can hear the difference. Find the perfect song with Musicbed's intuitive search features like genre, mood, beats per minute, and my favorite, key. Head over to howtofilmweddings.com slash musicbed to learn more and take your films to the next level. Use promo code HTFW23 at checkout to receive one month free with the purchase of an annual subscription. That's howtofilmweddings.com slash musicbed. Yeah, things I'm thinking about um, that I want to try this year. Like I said, we have our angles. I, I heard, I think it was Rick and Sarah with Pen Wedding saying like, this is the meat and potatoes of the day. I'm not trying to necessarily get all fancy and make this the sizzly part of the day. Mm-hmm. This is the steak, not the sizzle. This is the, so that we are capturing this and just not touching our, like once we get things locked down, I'm not touching those cameras. I'm not trying to zoom in. I'm not trying to change my shutter speed. I'm not trying to, none of that stuff because I don't know what it is about us wedding filmmakers, but like the groom's about to do his vows and I feel like I need to touch my camera right. to get it back in focus. Right, right. It's been in focus the whole time or, um, or whatever. And so, um, but for me, like I want those angles locked down and instead of having like a fourth angle, that's also locked down. That's where just having with the Sony's now a roaming camera that's rolling and I'm getting different angles, especially if it's like an outdoor or easy to get around without making a ruckus, uh, you know, or whatever. It's it was really fun at Lake Placid last year to to break that 180 rule and get some different angles of the couple looking at each other from back, seeing people's reaction over their shoulders, or um, and I was making sure that the photographer was aware where I'm at and stuff. But getting those reactions really did up the value of the storytelling. And if you know about the couple and that mom's really important, or that dad's really important, or Mimi's really important, or whoever it is you can get some shots of them and how valuable is that going to be to them, uh, to the couple in 10, 15 years when Mimi's gone, you know, to, to be in a better place or whatever. I, I'm thinking about all those things and, um, it's just really important to the ethos of my business and, and what I want to do. So intentionality. And so maybe think and walk it over with your business partner, your spouse, your friends, whatever, what's important to you when it comes to a ceremony. Why do I want to capture that? I do, once everything is locked, I do take a little bit of time to say, if I could get three shots that were like sizzly for a teaser, what would they be? And for me, most of the time, it's going to be a gimbal shot, you know, wide, wide behind the back of the ceremony, just a little bit of movement, nothing crazy to kind of show off how beautiful the ceremony is. It's really pretty. And so a couple of sizzle shots, but we're trying to keep it really simple. I wanted to talk about, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I wanted to talk about this too. When, when talking about a ceremony, um, 
24p versus 60p also kelvin versus auto white balance making sure that your cameras are matching that sort of thing what are you doing how are you doing it right go for it since with with uh when we were shooting on the c100s we were shooting at 60 all day um ceremony like everything was in 60 um mostly because the file sizes were or small on the C100 and it looks really good. And we were like, you know, we would flip it over and then forget to go back and, and that sort of stuff. And so we've just decided to shoot everything on 60 on the C100. Um, now that we're over on Sony and the 60 FPS file sizes are just so massive in 4K that for toasts and ceremony and letter, any, anything that's going to be a little bit longer of a clip, we are going down to 24 frames per second. So um, going down to 24p for our ceremony stuff for sure. We are doing our best to match Kelvin, um, you know, within a few uh, degrees. The, especially if you're doing if you're doing an indoor ceremony I, and there's not much window light um, where the lighting isn't going to fluctuate like at all. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily wrong to put it on auto if you're having trouble because it's not, it shouldn't change very much. But if you are in a place where light is going to be shifting, it's going to get brighter, it's going to get darker, sun's going to come in and out, like that sort of stuff, I would highly recommend doing Kelvin because what's going to happen is it's going to start at 5,000 and then the sun moves and then it jumps up to 6,500 and then the sun moves again or the clouds move again and it drops down to 4,200 and now you're having a beast of a time trying to color match that stuff mm -hmm. in post um, and then depending on which way your cameras are, are pointed, they're not going to be the same ever. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to do Kelvin for everything just for that consistency factor. Um, and then we'll have more control. So we're doing 24 P shooting in Kelvin, um, and trying to get our settings matching as best as we can. Yeah. And if you're listening to this and saying, what the heck are they talking about? This is something where like our complete wedding videography course is going to help you a ton, just walking through what that actually means. Because I knew for the longest time I would shoot auto white balance, especially outside sun is changing and I couldn't ever get the skin tones to look like what I wanted. They couldn't get it to match between different cameras. And it's not difficult, but just understanding, okay, the light outside is somewhere around 6,000 Kelvin right now. So I want to set my camera to that. And I want to tell my second shooter 6,000 K. That's like, that's where we're going to be for the ceremony and keeping up with that a little bit. But if you're on auto, it kind of just fluctuates up and down depending on where the angle is and all that and it's just really difficult to put you know you get color grading and you like okay i got this one frame looking like what i want it to look like and then you fast forward two minutes in the clip and it looks like hot garbage because the sun went behind a cloud and now everything's off so having like a consistent hey it's just right here at six thousand, you can fix whatever's happening a lot easier and make it look better and it's like oh well why does that matter again by having those things dialed in, you can convey emotion in a way that you want differently. It looks more expensive. It looks more produced in a good way. Um, and so those little things matter to me. Uh, I will throw out the, the caveat that I didn't do manual Kelvin until after 10 years of being in business, but it's not as hard or scary as I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. And so I'm shooting in manual Kelvin. If I walk into a room, I just did a ceremony the other day where it was like the, the whole back wall was uh, windows, but the windows were, were small on the back wall. So window light was coming in on the top of their heads, but then there was like overhead tungsten and then a couple of fluorescent lights. Beautiful venue, the worst lighting. I was like, what the heck? I walked in and I threw my camera on auto and it said it was like 4,200 was like, and so I was like, okay, that gave me a little bit of a, um, a start. But because now I know my cameras, my Sony's, I was looking and I, on my monitor and it was like the skin tones are still too pink. I was able to go in and then I started at 4,400 and then I dialed some of those magentas and pinks out of the color and was able to go a little bit geekier and say, I manually moved this tone in and I was having my second shooter stand where the ceremony was going to be. So I know this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do 4,400 Kelvin and I'm going to push my 
gammas to the like i'm gonna go push over towards the greens more so some of this magenta and i dial it in we hit record we take a couple clips we look at it and say yes this looks good instead of i'm just gonna wing it yeah yeah that's all that's all really good so next level stuff yeah 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 but those are the kind of things that are definitely going to propel you um in your filmmaking career uh we're about we're about wrap Time to wrap up, but I wanted to touch base real quick on if you're a solo shooter mm-hmm. and what I would do. Um, and I'm going to say with two cameras, if I'm filming a ceremony with two cameras, um, I would put one as like my static camera as high as I could in a back corner, like behind the back row, hanging, as high as I could. Hanging from the ceiling. Hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> I actually, before to get this, I actually uh, screwed my camera into my heavy duty light stand and just like raised it up. So it was up like seven feet in the air. So I know that no one would uh, run into it. So get it up as high as you can. And then I would film the processional, like getting people's faces as they're walking down the aisle. So then I have those two angles. And then when the ceremony starts, I would have like... I don't know, in the middle of the aisle at the very, very back, or maybe just to the right or the left, kind of depending of the aisle, but I would have one as tight as I could, so it kind of gets a tight of the couple straight on, and then one that's a little bit wider, maybe full body, head to toe, just straight on. So I have two straight on angles that I can kind of cut back and forth. That's what I have done several times whenever we haven't been able to do our situation, you know, how we like to do it because of space or something, but if I only had two cameras... That's how I would do it. Can I tell you what I would do? Or, oh, yes, go ahead. yes. No, you or, do your or. Or, or the other thing is, is um, you know, you could always leave that one up high, you know, for the whole thing. And then you could kind of run around and get tighter angles, you know, yeah. all that sort of stuff. It just depends on what you want to do. But that was, that was what I was going to say. I remember a wedding I did maybe 10 years ago in uh, Napa in the California area. And it was like the angles of where the vows were going to be if I did shoot across like these beautiful mountains or like this valley it was just like the background was going to be way better and so i was like i put the high angle up at the back middle during the ceremony and then when the bride started doing her vows you know i was way over to the right shooting across getting her vows and then as soon as she finished picked up my camera from my monopod which i was on at that time and just kind of hightailed it around the back and missed the first line of the groom's vows so i could then go get his vows but I was able to cut to that safe angle mm-hmm. while I was doing that. Just make sure you don't get in that angle. Um, and then, yeah, I was, uh, you're going to get sweaty. You're going to, yeah, yeah, you're going to, and I would encourage you cameras these days. They're just not that expensive. I mean, there are some very expensive ones, but like if you're, you know, whatever brand you're on, there is a cheap version that would be solid for a ceremony as in five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars cheap. I know it's relative, but you can rent cameras like having that third camera there if like even solo shooting two is going to work but just play around with it and i guess the idea is intentionality like yeah. what do you yeah. want the For ceremony sure. to look like and then also just like just because you see what nick and i are able to do during a ceremony if you're solo shooting you might not be able to replicate that and that's an upsell option to your couple if they it's like I can have another person there just at the ceremony. It's going to be five hundred dollars more, but it takes your ceremony from this to this. You could show them two different um, options or whatever. But I'm just as I'm getting maybe I'm just getting old. But it's like I don't solo shoot anymore. And if I am solo shooting, I still bring somebody that's like an assistant that can kind of watch the angles and do different help me set up tripods and tear things down because those moments are just too important to just like try to be doing on your own. But then I know people yep. like Stanton, Stanton from films by Stanton is just running around filming solo and mm-hmm. doing his thing. Yeah. 100%. So those are some of the things that we're thinking about whenever it comes to shooting a wedding ceremony in, uh, 2023. Uh, <laughs> uh, John's leaning into my, my frame over here. Um, and so again, as we wrap up today's episode, we want to remind you to go check out complete wedding uh, If you are interested in our course, or even if you just want to read more information about kind of what we're offering, the things that we're doing with that, you can get a free section uh, on consultations, like how we're talking to our couples, how we're communicating with them, how we're selling them actually, um, in, in kind of those initial meetings, um, a behind the scenes that John did, this new shooting part section from the module. And then we're also giving away our wedding day questionnaire. It's a $35 value that we sell in our, in yeah. our, uh, in our shop. That's all included uh, just for you to kind of 
um, open it up and kind of check out and see what the course is all about. Yeah. And, uh, we love the complete wedding videography course. There have been hundreds, not dozens anymore, but hundreds and hundreds of people who've been through it. We have a ton of raving reviews, testimonials of people that have changed their business. They've raised their prices. They've made better wedding films. And as the community grows with how to film weddings, it makes us more and more excited to be able to not have to create all kinds of new courses all the time, but to continually pour into this flagship course that we have, our signature course. And we're constantly adding things to it. If I'm doing a consultation with a couple, I'm recording it on Zoom, I'm putting it in the course. If And we're doing new behind the scenes every year. new like And so if you've joined before, um, this is all going to be stuff that just added. So log in to your course. You'll be able to see the brand new wedding day that we shot over two days and on, on location at a real venue. All these updated things. We've got our templates for your pricing guides. We've got consultation guides. We've got posing guides. We've got everything that you need to run a six figure business. And it's $1,497 for the full price or $147 payments. Like we wanted to make it kind of a no brainer to kind of be that handbook, especially if you're in your, you're in your first four or five years of doing this, you're going to get so much value. And then I wanted to throw it out there too. We've had this course. This is like the fourth year. Uh, We've continually updated it, but over four years, we've always offered a 21 day guarantee money back guarantee Mm -hmm. that if you join the course you look through the information you don't think it's valuable then we'll just give you your money back our goal is not how can we tear money from your hands our goal is we want to continually like it costs lots of money to go rent wedding venues and do these behind the scenes shoots and pour all this energy and that's where that money goes it goes to really doing that and 1497 for a course uh, we could easily charge 3000 4000 5000 for this course yeah yeah so uh again more information at completeweddingvideography.com john it has been great to hang out with you this last week and to be in person here podcasting together high five <laughs> listeners thank you for tuning in and until next time we will see ya see ya